and welcome to another Razor Wire. Today, we're going to be talking about the post-pandemic view of defense in depth, how it's changing or how it has changed or as it is changing and transitioning at the moment. And t- today, I have two fantastic guests, one that you've seen many times before. We've got the fantastic Jonathan Kerr and one that you, who's a new new guy to the, to the channel. We've got Christopher Fielder. Um, Christopher, do you want to kind of give a bit of a quick intro to yourself and then I'll get John to do the same? Sure, quick. Uh, let's see here. I'm the uh, field CTO at Arctic Wolf, but I've been in cybersecurity for uh, over 20 years now, range of capacities. So United States military, the United States uh, security agency, and then transitioning into a analyst role, hands-on keyboard. Decided I wanted sleep, so I transitioned out of an analyst role and more into like what I'm doing now, which is more of a research and uh, this type of communication role that I really enjoy. Fantastic. And Jonathan? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, Jonathan Kerr. I, as I say, I'm an advisor with Lionfish Tech Advisors, um, former Gartner analyst, and uh, now, as I say, obviously, I'm working with uh, Lionfish, and we are um, engaged in the process of building companies up rather than rating them, which is uh, which is actually quite a lot of fun. And I also, um, for my sins, uh, write a column and present on uh, darkreading.com as well. Fantastic. So we only have Jonathan for another 20-odd minutes or so before we're going to lose him. So we're going to hit this hard, hit this fast, and we'll just see, you know, how, how where we get to. So... As we all know, the world has just come out of a particularly interesting time where a lot of us in a lot of different countries were locked down due to some particular virus that had been going around and causing significant trouble to pretty much everybody on the planet. Um, different countries were locked down for different time periods. Here in the UK, it was about a year, year and a half with a few sort of breaks in between. I know in the States, it was kind of similar, maybe... Some of the some of the states over in the states uh, were locked down a little bit longer than others, and there were other restrictions that came in. But I think for all of us, and for the for the economy in general, be it infosec, be it IT, be it whatever, it was a particularly difficult time for everybody. Um, none of us could go into the office. Uh, we were all working from home, and the transition from going from working in an office where you could just go over and have a chat with one of your work colleagues or you know, have a cup of coffee with them and discuss something, kind of died in one day, seemingly. (laughs) One minute, everything was fine. And then the next minute, boom, we're all sort of sitting there wondering, oh, now we're going to have to use something like Teams or Zoom or, um, you know, the the Google equivalent. So, you know, it was was quite a significant time for everybody. And, And, you know, what did you guys think when it first, kicked off? I mean, what was your first impressions? I went out onto my patio and looked at my garden. I thought, I wonder I wonder what's creeping through the air towards me, because obviously we didn't know anything about, uh, um, you know, about the, uh, the, the transmission of it really very much at the time. Um, but very quickly, actually, from an employment point of view, sort of in my day job, um, I had a lot of clients extremely worried about uh, how to manage, all of a sudden, remote workers. And I think the one thing that also came across is the biggest pain point was actually with managers who said, hang on, I can no longer put my arms around my staff, metaphorically speaking. (laughs) Um, (laughs) About to say. The world has moved on. Um, 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 But yeah, you can no longer manage by walking around. And so the question then came, well, first of all, um, how do I make sure people are doing their jobs? Well, you know, now, in fact, you're more managing by objectives. Um, and the second thing was, am I still relevant if I'm no longer walking the job? And so a lot of managers were going, I need mean, to kind of justify my own existence here. And one of the things that I also saw, which I um, dissuaded people from strongly, was um, feeling that you know the the need to supervise uh, overrode any employee's need for privacy, um, and I had a, um, I had uh, you know several fun conversations. People saying, "Well, I want to be able to turn everyone's webcams on so I can see what they're doing." 
I was like, well, let me tell you about a um, let me tell you about a colleague of mine who uh, has um, a colleague and friend of mine who has um, you know some young children. And uh, you know her normal practice, um, you know, before before COVID was to uh, um, uh, she would come home, set up uh, her laptop uh, on the island in the kitchen, and after the bath, she would you know work, catch up on emails, you know, while the kids cavorted around in states of various undress or not. And I said, how would you feel about capturing all of that and storing picture, image, videos of young children in the unclothed uh, on your corporate servers? And they went, oh, yeah, it's not a good idea after all. And so I think there was this, as I say, there was a radical reset needed in a lot of people's thinking, which is essentially, how do we change this? And from a management point of view, I think it's very much uh, changed to management by task. Uh, rather than management by presence, rather than management by you know who showed up first in the office and all the rest of that malarkey, it really was a case of who's actually getting things done. So in many ways, it was positive. Okay, Christopher, you're in a completely different part of the world. How was it over over your your neck of the woods? Yeah, so the earliest days of the pandemic, I really there's two key thoughts that come to mind. You know, when I'm I'm thinking back my early memories of it, the first one is you know we saw a lot of kind of a slow breakdown of the traditional network barrier, what was considered like this is the perimeter of a network. And one of my early thoughts was when everyone immediately snapped to remote is well that's the that's the dissolution. That's the death knell of the traditional network perimeter. Like we're done now. Like we're we can't go back into that arena. Now we are starting to go back into offices. We're starting to develop a, a, a somewhat of a traditional network approach. But by no means are we going to go back to that. Hey, your network is. When's the last time you heard the term LAN used a lot? Right. Mm. You're not hearing that nearly as like you used to. Uh, another early thought I had was I remember hearing about some malicious. Uh, uh, groups, some threat groups that were saying, because of what's going on, we're going to take the Robin Hood approach. We're not going to attack anybody that is doing anything that is positive. We're going to uh, kind of go on hiatus. We're not going to attack any hospitals, things like that. And my early thought was, let's start the clock and see how long that lasts for. Because uh, they may be saying that. Up front. The five minute mark or. <laughs> we didn't get very far. We got, what, maybe a couple of days before we started hearing about opposite. So, yeah, it, it was great publicity for those groups for a day or two, and that's about all that lasted. And I think the other thing is, um, I mean, different sectors had different experiences, and we're kind of focusing on the traditional offices, I suppose, because we, during the pandemic, we all stayed home and watched episodes of The Office. But uh, um, <laughs> I think that if you look at retail, um, there was a dramatic shift not just in the obvious one, um, you know, everyone stayed at home, shopped online, but think about the impact of that on the financial industry, the payment ecosystems and so on as well. Mm. Um, and as you say, we, we saw a lot, of, um, yeah, a lot of companies going, wow, this is a massive change that we weren't prepared for. Um, and, you know, we saw several companies who were shuttered up, um, obviously, uh, the online retailers like Amazon did spectacularly well out of it. Um, um, but it, that was one of the most interesting things for me was that, um, you know, people's behaviors um, in terms of, you know, shopping, whether it be groceries, whatever it may be, changed dramatically. Everyone bought guitars, like this one behind me. <laughs> 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 we we had been migrating, you know, to a certain extent over to kind of like a, a working from home thing, not not a permanent thing, but we were all used to having a day, maybe two sometimes if you were lucky on some of the more sort of interesting comes. Or sometimes you'd get people who were completely remote. It wasn't completely an anomaly, but I think if we hadn't had that time, over time we would have seen that movement happen, you know, quite a bit. More methodical. Yeah, you know, so so us in InfoSec probably would have found this a little bit easier to swallow because not only did we have a situation where, um, you know, obviously we were all suddenly working from home and we were all worried in our own personal lives about what was going on in the world, um, but we were suddenly told, right, now we've, you know, as you quite rightly said, Christopher, um, the, the, the perimeter has changed. Everybody's working from home. By the way, all projects are canned and we're keeping our budgets because we're not too sure how long this is going to go on for whilst we, whilst we can't effectively 
you know, make money, you know, for a lot of organizations. Um, oh, and by the way, you still got to secure it. it. It points out a flaw that I think still exists, unfortunately, that I hope we can begin to transition away from. And that's that a lot of security teams and security departments are subordinate to the overall IT team. Not separate, not equal, but subordinate. And so, unfortunately, this question happens a lot of can we, not should we? And so, you know, in that situation, it was simply, can we go completely remote? Yes, we're going to go completely remote. That's not a question. We have to. And as you said, now you're in charge of making sure it's secure one way or another. And if it's not, then it's unfortunately, you're on the hook for it. Uh, we're still seeing that problem quite often with, can we add cloud, cloud resources? Can, can we add cloud capabilities? Not should we? And the security team quite often that we're running into is the afterthought there as well of being told, hey, we've added this. We've already paid for it. Now you are in charge of monitoring it one way or another. Um, I think there's another, and I think there's the, the other side as well. Um, yes, I think the shift to cloud was certainly augmented because people went, oh, yeah, well, why not? We can make something that's accessible everywhere, and that's probably a good thing. Um, and, yeah, you obviously saw ancillary industries like uh, SASE and SSE uh, spring up as well. Um, one of the things I think that, again, is interesting from a people side um, and the industry side is uh, a lot of organizations using third-party contact centers um, had a, a, puck, uh, a pucker moment, if I can put it that way, because they saw that, or certainly the people running these outsourced contact centers thought, well, you know, we've been able to offer them a clean room environment where people don't bring notebooks in and where people don't bring phones in or cameras in. And, you know, they would never do something like this, which is to those of you listening at home, I'm holding up my phone and pretending to take a screenshot. Um, and of course, that's quite, um, you know, that's quite important in regulated industries, banking, healthcare, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, and I think there was this concern, well, uh, again, if we, we have to, we've sent all our contact centers, whether they be uh, in-house or whether they be through a third party, we sent them all home. How do we ensure that? So again, you saw this kind of nascent industry with companies coming up saying, hey, we can detect when somebody points a phone or points a camera at the screen and we can lock the screen automatically. We can detect if two heads appear in the camera and again, lock the screen automatically and so on and so forth. Um, and so all of that's interesting because there's a lot of stuff there actually that is applicable, even as Christopher says, when we're now starting to move back into the the world of the office, or at least hybrid office working. That's still kind of you that still is kind of useful. And this idea will actually being able to detect if there are two people looking at the screen, maybe that is appropriate for even just like an R and D setup or something like that. Yeah, it's interesting. And I know you've got you've got to leave very, very shortly. I mean, John, where do you think I mean, obviously, we're we're not going back to the office, and as you quite rightly pointed out, you know, we're in a hybrid scenario here where a lot of people are, are working from home predominantly and popping into the office once or twice a week for various different meetings, that kind of thing. Now, economically, for companies, they're seeing a massive increase in funds in this because they're not paying for the heat, they're not paying for the light, they're not paying for you know electrical costs, they're not paying for the water. They don't need to have those massive offices sitting in the middle of, of Canary Wharf or if you're over in the States, in the, you know, on Broadway in New York. So they've, they've driven the cost of running their business down. But, you know, where, where are you seeing some of your customers kind of getting worried at the moment? I mean, I see, I've seen a massive shift myself towards kind of uh, endpoint detection, endpoint management, you know, sort of clients on the local endpoint to find out what's going on and, and, and who's doing what. And we're also seeing quite a bit in security intelligence because people seem to be looking more now towards the groups and saying, right, who's talking about attacking us or who's who's gotten into one of our third parties? And, and you did mention the third parties there as well, which I think is something I'm going to explore a little bit more with Christopher in a moment. But since, you, since you've got a very short period of time, what are your sort of final thoughts? I think the final thought is that um, the supply chain has become more important. And hey, guess what? Every remote worker is now in the supply chain. Um, so you now have to take advantage of that. With the, um, when the log 4J thing broke, um, people running around going, what about all those remote workers' routers um, that are also exposed to this? And they suddenly realized that their footprint in their exposure map, if I can call it that, was a lot larger than they thought. 
Um, I think that um, ultimately, I think the the biggest resistance point is to the com- is to the organisations that were hidebound, and whether it because they had a um, um, a high security. Um, so there are obviously there are industries, some public, some private, that re- that do need a secure, compartmentalised environment in which to work in. And I think that was certainly you know that 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 problem didn't go away. And obviously, uh, uh, you couldn't sort of have, move you know this highly confidential information into people's homes. Um, but I think what it also is say for me the most important thing was um, the realization that yeah. How how important is it for people to be commuting, um, and balance that? As I say the impact to the environment, balance it the impact um, you know to people's lives and so on. Versus, um, as I say, a a manager's need to be able to walk around and survey his minions or her minions. Uh, I think that uh, that to me has been one of the biggest changes. I think you know that we have gone. It has forced, and I think it's a positive thing, a management towards objective. Well, thank you, John. You, you're going to have to dash off now. So um, look after yourself, and we'll see you on on that. You know, on the next podcast. I think we've got you got you pegged for a couple of them. Great meeting you. Great meeting you too, Christopher. Thanks for your time, everybody. And uh, at home, have a good day. Okay. So, and then there was two. <laughs> I want to actually jump on something that you mentioned before, which, uh, if you don't mind me kind of adding to that. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. So you're mentioning you're seeing a lot more of a transition to endpoint, right? The, the mm. endpoint security, endpoint focus, whether it's EDR, EPP, NGAV, whatever can be thrown on an endpoint, right? And then a transition or more of a focus on artificial intelligence, machine learning, threat intelligence. Hey, how can we detect things? We did some research on that and we, we asked, you know, hey, why are you investing in these areas? Why are you investing more? And the root cause we found here in the States, maybe you as well, uh, was that it's, it's to compensate for lack of people, quality people that they can get as analysts or get to do the job. They're saying if we can't get the, the people in the seats, then what is the next best thing? artificial intelligence or more detections that are happening automatically on the endpoint. So I think that is something that we're really seeing a lot more coming out of the pandemic as well, is a lot of analysts and people saying, I don't want to go back to the office, or I don't want to go back and do that job for the same you were paying me. And if you're not going to pay me what I feel that I deserve, there are hundreds of jobs, thousands, millions of jobs that are open right now that will pay me what I feel that I deserve. So I'll find somewhere else. And it's culminating in this major problem. How many times do you hear people talk about the security skills gap, right? And just not enough people to do the job. I think, you know, in many respects, the the lockdowns and the, you know, the, 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 the situation we were there, ignore the virus, ignore all mm-hmm. of that. You know, and we have to be careful because this is going on YouTube and we know they can all get twitchy <laughs> about things like that. Um, I think that that was, that, that was the turning point and the catalyst for a massive expansion in technological advancement. Um, and we have saw a massive amount of information security companies suddenly crop up over, over that lockdown period. And boom, all of a sudden, you know, we've got a million Israeli companies coming out into this space. We've got a lot of American companies, which has stalled a bit due to obviously the the, the problems you had with the Silicon Valley banking institutions, which uh, <laughs> folded and took a lot of, I'm guessing, a lot of VC money that, that should have gone there away. I know that's all being resolved, but, you know, it, all of these things, all of this, you know, the massive amount of increase of ransomware groups and the, mm-hmm. the Conti tapes that show, you know, Conti pages or whatever tapes, whatever you want to call them, that showed how they work. You know, yep. I mean, you and I being InfoSec professionals, I mean, we, we always kind of knew that's roughly how we thought it would work. You know, oh, yeah. you, you hear things, you, you, you do a bit of your own research. But having it confirmed like that and the fact that they were so orderly and they were so... It's a business. They see themselves not as criminals, but as a business in an area that's maybe not the, uh, the nicest. But hey, what's the, what's the easiest way to go to work every day if that's what you do? Convince yourself that you're just a normal business person. You're just doing a job, right? It, it's, it's a way to pay for your bills, put food on the table, and maybe it's a little fun once in a while. So yeah, they just see themselves as a legitimate business. But this is it. I mean, you know, I think 
And going back to the subject matter of defense in depth, we could talk all day long about, you know, how technology is changing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned artificial intelligence and machine learning. I mean, cripes, I've never... I've always, I've always loved that kind of technology, and I always thought that that was the next real logical step in 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 evolution from a technological sense. Um, and I thought we were quite a quite a lot further away than we seem to actually be. We seem to be yeah. hitting it with a hell. You know, we're on this big train that's steaming down the tracks, and there's there's the feeling like there's there's nobody at the front <laughs> organizing where it's going. I mean. Even some big figures have turned around and said, we need to kind of slow this down a bit and seriously think about what we're doing. And, and whether you love those personalities, whether you hate those personalities, and as much as I love AI, I can, I've seen what happens when you implement technology without considering security at all. And it, it's, it scares the bejesus out of me. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not saying we're going to wind up all sort of huddled in basements hiding from the robots that are coming to murder us all. <laughs> Although we might, we don't know. I was, I was reading last night about something called uh, Chaos GPT. I don't know if you ever read about that one. Basically, someone created a demonstration to say, hey, how quickly can we turn an AI evil and turn it against humanity? And it was minutes, days. <laughs> it was nothing. Yeah, so it's very quickly. We did a we did another podcast on artificial intelligence, uh, you know, and how it could be how we would use it for you know on the good the light side of infosec, but then how would it be used on the dark side? Because I think a lot of people think, oh well, we've got AI, so we'll be fine. We'll just you know pit them against the bad guys. It's like no, guys, you do realize that they're going to have access to the same technology that we have, only with a lot less morals and a lot less ethics. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is your AI better than my AI? And then how can you prove it? Yeah. But but if you lock an AI, and we're talking about AI now, if you're locking about AI with ethics and you have an AI without any ethics, then who's going to win? It's always going to be the one without the ethics because it just doesn't care. Bring it back to defense in depth, right? We're seeing this explosion of AI and machine learning coming out of the post-pandemic because individuals did say, I don't have the people or I don't have the people in the office or whatever. I need to compensate for that. I'm not going to lose money, right? That was kind of the last thing businesses wanted to do. So what can I purchase or what could I buy or what could I develop to kind of bridge some of those gaps, fill some of those holes. And unfortunately, well, or fortunately, depending upon how you look at it, AI is what did that. And it goes back to what I said earlier, which is a problem I see far too often, which is can we, not should we, can we develop faster, better artificial intelligence? And then later on, we'll go we'll scratch our heads and go, well, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Maybe that was a bad idea. And I'm hoping that's not the case in the future. Uh, I'm a huge Asimov fan. Uh, in fact, I've got the I've got the three laws of robotics tattooed on me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping the uh, the next generation of designers take that into consideration. I just I, I mean it, it, you know again I mean there's that particular technology would have so much meaning for infosec people. It's like I mean I hypothesized in in the two podcasts we were talking about. You know you'd end up with a companion to the infosec professional. So the infosec professional would be the the, the brain, the one that's making the decisions and deciding what to do and all the rest of it. But you would have this AI companion that would be sat kind of almost like on your shoulder going, right, this is what I've discovered. I mean, it can go through more data than I could ever look at in 10, you know, in 10 years in, in seconds flat. It can I, give me all the information that I need to make that informed decision. And I think that's where the power of AI really lies, you know, Obviously, when we start going down the, the 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 slightly more interesting route of free thinking AIs, that's that's another thing entirely. And maybe we'll we'll, we'll cover that in another podcast. I'll invite you on that one. <laughs> Sounds that's like great. AI is your thing. I know it's it's your company's thing. So, but um, I think that's really logically where you probably want to get to for the at least the next stage. And I think for for the next stage of infosec protection, you know, if we are going to be facing down. Some of these emerging threats, and 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 it should be noted that as fast as we're producing technology to to be able to deal with all of this, the 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 other side, the dark side of the fall, so to speak, they're doing exactly the same thing. If not, they're probably better funded. This is a frightening thing. They're taking that sixty four million they got from that insurance company that shall remain nameless, <laughs> and they're not just buying houses with it and stuff like that. Because that, weirdly enough, that's how you get caught when you've been stealing large amounts of money. 
you know, but what you can do is you can pile it into development to make your jobs easier, to make your lives easier. And I think they're doing that funding. I mean, let's look at it this way. We're talking about defense in depth and post pandemic and, and the fact that we're all working from home. These people have been working from home ind- independently for years in their groups. They don't know one another half the time. They, they, they go by a handle. Exactly. They yeah, go by a handle. You know. They don't know each other. I've been working from home for over 15 years now, you know? So it, it wasn't a crazy transition for me. The transition was getting used to everybody else working from home. Yeah, there was a lot of panicking. I noticed that. There was a lot of people who were, who were just, they just weren't coping with it. <laughs> and I, think, I think it pointed out. So let me, let me hit on two things you said real quick, if that's okay. Uh, one is, you know, at Arctic Wolf, we really do like artificial intelligence, but we don't use it by itself. We use it as a tool. We, we insist that it's human in the loop. Otherwise, it's just going to generate a lot of noise and you don't know what's actually going to be positive and negative. So we like it as a tool, not as a solution, if that makes sense. Uh, and the other thing was, you know, I think that the the pandemic helped point out a lot of flaws in security architectures and it pointed out a lot of flaws in marketing, right? And one of those key things was this focus on endpoint security. I came from a, an endpoint vendor myself before I was at Arctic Wolf. Uh, a very, it was at the time, a very large name endpoint vendor that I was super proud of. Um, and we we pushed that marketing heavy of endpoint is all that matters. Endpoint security is security. An attacker will ultimately land on an endpoint, right? The attacker's primary goal is the endpoint, which is true to a point because you go, okay, well, how do you define endpoint? That's something. If, if your idea of an endpoint is just a Windows machine, then you're going to be in trouble because you have so much else that's considered an endpoint. And the other is, if you're focusing entirely on endpoint security, I have two questions for you. One, number one, Are you 100% deployed to every endpoint in your environment? And number two, can you guarantee you will stay 100% deployed to every endpoint in your environment? Because if you are not, let's say you're 98% covered, you're leaving 2% uncovered, and guess what the attacker is going for? They're going for that 2%. Absolutely. So that is a flaw of saying, I'm going to go all in on endpoint security, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Good luck. I mean, you've got one area covered. (laughs) Well, this is it. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the, the rules for defense in depth, the, the, the way that I've applied them over my 25 years in this, in this space has never really changed. You know, the technologies that I've used to do that, the, 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 uh, the various different skill sets and all the rest of it that have been developed over time and the people that I've used because people process the technology, you know, you hear that time and time again to do blue in the face. That has sometimes changed the way that you, you, you interact with it. But the, the, the logical idea behind defense in depth is you have countermeasures on a people, a process, and a technological perspective that blend in together and weave this kind of... We used to, in the old days, we used to call it like the security onion. You know, it was like each layer of the onion was a, nif- a different piece of the, the, the puzzle and to, to, you know, to protect the asset in the middle, which was data or, you know, specific servers when we all had on-prem stuff. And obviously, that's all shifted and changed. Um, now, I see a lot more people using like an iceberg. And I must admit, I prefer the iceberg analogy nowadays because <laughs> it, kind of, it kind of shows a little bit more when you, when you think about what an iceberg is. But all we're do, having to do now is we're having to re-engineer our defense in depth. But my question to you is, do you think organizations, bearing in mind economically, they had a year, year and a half, some, some, in some cases, two years where they were not generating efficient profit um, to actually change their defense in depth? Because security, security departments, CISOs, however your security is, is termed, and this is why I'm interested to get your opinion. Because I mean, I see, I speak to a lot of people, but you probably speak to a lot more people. <laughs> um, you know, are they finding it really difficult? I mean, we're, we're quite often we're, beforehand, we were being asked to secure the environment with the equivalent of five pounds and a pickled egg, and mm-hmm. maybe a packet of crisps if you were lucky. <laughs> um, you know, it's all sticky tape and chewing gum. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we're having to re-engineer entire environments and bring on new tools while still being licensed for the old tools and waiting for that to run out. Is that what you're seeing a lot of, of from your clients or is it something different? Unfortunately, it is, right? There are patchworks of security uh, stacks and technology. and But the positive, what I'm seeing as a positive is 
a lot more organizations are acknowledging that there's a problem, right? And you cannot overcome it if you don't first acknowledge there's an issue. And so we're seeing a lot more organizations that are reaching out saying, we know we have a problem. We know we need to fix it. We just either don't have the budget or the people or the time, whatever it is. Please, somebody help us. Now, as a services company like we are, we can't help them with the budget. We're not going to give them the money, but we can provide almost everything else, right? Uh, we can provide the visibility, we can provide the people, and we can help them design the policies to then get to that better place. Defense in depth is absolutely necessary for any organization. It's sort of kind of a foundation for Arctic Wolf. You know, we take a look at endpoint, network, cloud, the behaviors, you know, everything that we can look at, we can, because that's the only way we're truly going to get a picture into the environment. Uh, Defense in depth is so important because it provides for redundancy and fail safes and eliminates that single point of failure, which is so important. When I was in the military, I worked in a vault for a while. It was a two person integrity vault, TPI, which meant two people had to be there to unlock the safe. It eliminated the single point of failure, eliminated the possibility that one person could go in and do something wrong or mess something up. A lot less organizations have the ability to do things like that now. And I love that you pointed out that it's the people, the process, and the technology, right? But what people are forgetting is that people are just as important in there. And so I see a lot of organizations that are siloing their people. They're saying, I've got my endpoint person. I've got my network person. I've got my analyst or whatever. And they're not really going to communicate or talk or blend over, which they absolutely should. Part of defense and defense in depth strategy is saying, let's cross train them, let's eliminate that single point of failure so that if my endpoint person gets a better position and they're out the door, I'm not dead in the water. I've got two people that can step in and help out until I can find somebody new, hopefully. So I think that's, you know, I love that you created that triangle, which I think that's part of the CISSP. It's been years since I've taken it. But, you know, we absolutely talk about that. So it's, it is really important to, to balance them effectively. No, I, I, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the, you know, one of the, the things, uh, I've been running a masterclass now for months and, and it's been going up and there's, there's been a lot of views on it. And we, and we kind of covered like war gaming. And you know the importance of wargaming to you know to to, to uh, test your BCP DR you know procedures and your your protocols and all the rest of it, but also more importantly to def- you know to, to logically test your defense in depth as well. And we found when we do scenarios, and we get a lot of customers asking us to do, help them with scenarios nowadays. We started putting in quite a few non-technical security events. So we did we did one for my own company where I died. They came mm-hmm. in one day and found me on the carpet. That's it, me gone. <laughs> okay. um, and and that was it. And it was like, right, guys, run the company. You know, and we we came out of that realizing that we had all the technology because obviously we're a security company. We've got access to it anyway. Um, you know, we've got all the skill sets, which is brilliant. You know, we've, we've got access to it anyway because that's what we do. That's, that's what Razor Thorn does. Um, but we, we suddenly realized how many issues there were from a security standpoint, for, just from decision making, you know, or from, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole thing and release all the secrets for all those people out there that are watching. <laughs> but, but, but we found things like that a hell of a lot more damaging to, to the organization than just that technological piece. Um, and I think that's where a lot of companies forget their defense in depth. Because you mentioned it quite, quite appropriately there. You know, um, uh, no single points of failure. Well, if you've got, say, one finance, if you're a small company, you've got a finance officer and that finance officer is the only one that has access to the bank account and they suddenly run off or get a, go into a coma or get hit by a bus, boom, you're not paying anyone for a while until you can get that issue resolved. Um, So you need to have two people with access to the bank account, you know, maybe with encryption. I've seen a massive massive resurgence in encryption, uh, specifically data encryption, using products that have some kind of a blockchain method. Um, And it'd be interesting to see what your your views are on that. Because rather now than, than, you know, focusing on the perimeter, which is what we used to do, We we used to have our fortress, we used to have all the, you know, all the uh, points inside that fortress. We'd have our data's uh, data sets. We'd have our servers and the rest of it. Then we went to the cloud, and that perimeter kind of changed, and our defense in depth had to change because all of a sudden we were reliant on a third party. And John mentioned it before he left. You know, 
we're now becoming keenly aware that our third parties have third parties. So it may be a cloud company providing you a cloud, but it's probably on Amazon or it's on Azure or, you know, and they may have people that support, supply them with backup solutions who have their, you know, their third parties who into, you know, who do deal with that product. And before you know it, a simple, small or medium sized business can have a supply chain ridiculously long. God forbid if you're a large company like a perfume company or a manufacturing company manufacturing computers or whatever where you source parts from all kinds of different locations and kit and, and programs as well. It's defense in depth is becoming a hell of a lot more complicated than I remember it being. I can tell I, you know. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So I would say to any company that's considering going to this cloud first approach or what you're saying involving a very, you know, detailed supply chain is, you know, do your due diligence, right? People are too quick to not do that and to simply transfer the risk and say, okay, well, I'm going to go to a cloud company. I'm going to just push it all to the cloud. And I, I think that it's safe. Make sure that you analyze what is their split responsibility model. What are you responsible for? What are they responsible for? They're probably more than likely holding up their end of the bargain. Are you holding up your end of the bargain? And do not push anything outside of your, quote, perimeter, right? Even though I know that term is very weak now. But don't don't push anything out that you're not willing to lose or that is super high valuable, right? You don't have to push everything to the cloud. A lot of it can go, but not everything. So you can keep some things internal, keep some, some things safe, but everything that you're like, okay, that's of lesser value or it's not, quote, the crown jewel, then you can push that externally. Um, I got a good story, if you don't mind, and you indulge me for a minute about the you know, defense in depth and kind of a breakdown here. But uh, years ago, I did a lot of offensive security and we were working on one contract. And uh, we know we discussed with them, they said, we want this to be a real world penetration testing scenario or essentially a real attacker. And we came back and said, are you sure you understand what real world means? <laughs> like, you're comfortable with that. They said, yes, we, we think we have a very you know, secure environment, but we want to test it. We want to make sure. I said, okay, we can do that. So you begin with reconnaissance, right? What can we find? And so we found just through some scanning and identifying some documents that they had a recent project where all of their data centers had installed the same model of networked UPC or uninterrupted power supply, right? And they didn't take the time to actually consider what they did. They just racked them, stacked them, plugged the cable in and walked away. Left all of them with the default password, left all of them network capable, and all of them were running all of their servers and infrastructure. So we verified, are you sure you want this real world? Yeah, they absolutely want it real world. So we wrote a script and had it every time the UP, uh, the uninterrupted power supplies came on, we had it start a countdown clock and shut them off strategically at all their data centers again and again and again. So just continuously, you know, denial of service, distributed denial of service, where you want to call it. But it's based on that idea that they just plug something into their environment that was a critical component to their architecture, but didn't consider what it could actually do, didn't monitor it, didn't change it, didn't even consider it what it was, which is an endpoint again, right? So there was no monitoring of it, and they just let it loose. And that is a breakdown of that defense in depth you know, concept. And it's a breakdown of something else that I think is a major concern now, which is the idea of change control. There used to be a much stricter change control policy of before anything got put in the environment, before anything got utilized, Everyone was brought to the table. Everyone had a say. Everyone can point out flaws or possibilities. And now it's much more, hey, we need this. We're going to put it out there. We'll deal with the consequences later. And I think that's also a result of the pandemic. And I'm hoping that we're starting to move past that because we saw the error of our ways. Yeah, actually, that's a really that's a really good point. And I hadn't thought of that because I've been wondering, you know, I mean, I, I do a lot of PCI DSS audits, um, a QSA for my sins, you know, yeah. God help me. Um, and I've noticed that a lot of the problems have been in the speed that people have wanted to get things done. And I can kind of understand, obviously, during the pandemic, I mean, one minute everybody was in an office and the next minute everybody was working from home. Um, but change control seems to have suffered quite significantly from that. And also, you know, being able to to impose certain levels of change control on your suppliers, because sometimes your suppliers are making changes and you're not even you're yeah. not even aware of it, you know. Um, or they've got suppliers who are not even 
you know, and, and as you say, it's the simplest things that can trip you up. It's the little thing that somebody didn't think of. Boom. Put it in your network, put it in your flat network infrastructure. We've heard of companies, well known large supermarket brands with refrigeration command and control servers that get compromised back, you know, from the refrigeration company who's a tiny little company. And before yep. you know it, the, the credit cards running through their tills, you know, till <laughs> infrastructures are being black posed. Um, yeah. we've, this, this is why defense in death is important. This is why having good detection, having good oversight, having good policies, procedures, you know, having a good, I mean, third party supply reviews are now so critical. I can't even, I can't even compute how important those things are for everybody. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more people requiring ISO, you know, for instance, on their suppliers. And it doesn't matter what the supplier is supplying. You know, it could be just developers developing a particular web app, for instance. But boom, no, there must be ISO, must have DevSecOps, you know, um, protocols and capability. And, and it's, I think it's, it's really log, it's really good in many respects that we're, we're now, or the business world is now considering security so importantly because they've seen what happens when it all goes horribly wrong. I do, and, and there's something, it definitely goes back to what you just said, but I'm seeing the problem now being the rate of change. It's being done and then it's being, we're being told, uh, you know, like we used to with development. Oh, we've developed this product over the last three years. By the way, could you review it from a security standpoint? Because somebody <laughs> said, we need to sign off. And it's like, right, okay, well, You've been developing it for three years. When did you want to get us involved? Yeah. They don't want a review. They want a sign off. They don't yeah, want they want to... the, yeah. They don't want to know the actual security. If you go back to them and say, I found all these security flaws, they're not happy. Oh no. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> like, uh, I want to pen yeah. test this application. Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah it, it's not what they actually want. They want you to give it a check mark and say it's good to go. And you're putting your name on the line. You're putting your company on the line. You can't do that. And it, you know. I'll kind of, if I could leave you with this, this is kind of my rebuttal to that concept of, you know, a single point of security or like, let's just say endpoint security, right? And the market share being, you know, every attack will ultimately land on an endpoint, right? Have you heard that before? Like that kind of market? I have, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I know the previous company that you worked for. (laughs) Okay, there you go. But the idea there is to say, okay, everything will land on an endpoint. Do you want to detect it when it lands? Or would you prefer to detect it if you have defense in depth before it lands on the endpoint? So that by the time it lands, you're already doing your investigation or you're prepared for it, and then you can respond to it. I kind of put it in this concept of, you know, somebody is going to burglarize your house. Would you prefer to find them when they're in your bedroom going through your wallet? Or would you rather know when they are pulling in the driveway, walking through the front door, making their way to your bedroom? In the same way, are you ready to detect on the endpoint? Or would you prefer to have all those other layers in place so that you can spot them early on and begin from that point? You're making a point. And to be honest, I'd rather detect them at all different, all of those different points. <laughs> you know, it's like if they have somehow managed to cleverly engineer their way around, you know, um, the CCTV on the outside of the house, and hopefully you've got something on the internal, like mm-hmm. an alarm or whatever, that's that going to kick in when that one fails. Again, this is why we go for defense in depth. I'm seeing a lot more asset based security now. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've noticed that. A lot more people oh, yeah. saying, you know, Right, where's our, where's our, you know, what's our crown jewels? Oh, it's the IP that we have for the new type of, of engine that we've, we're creating. Right, encrypt the lot. Independently, away from the, you know, Active Directory or away from our, our standard logins and all the rest of it, an independent, uh, encryption that we can then, you know, and, and the cool thing is actually, uh, as you use when you were looking after that vault, you can now have encryption that requires two, you know, two checks to, mm-hmm. to, to open it up. You know, we use it ourselves for our own encryption. It's really, really nice product. Um, you know, I have to authorize it and then say the finance officer has to authorize it to get into specific types of HR files, you know, um, or whatever. And it's, we can now do all of that. It's a bit of a pain because yeah. you've got to train people. <laughs> you, got, you do have to train people to get used to it, which can be a bit, which can be a bit tough because, you know, nobody wants additional stuff you know, to do in their day-to-day job, like, I don't know, clicking on a phone twice to authorize access to a file. Nobody said being secure was easy. 
no, this is it. And, <laughs> and we do all have to make sacrifices as well. Yeah. You know, it's it's like, you know, you remember how much how much of a pain passwords, uh, usernames or passwords were. Uh, now we're two-factor authentication. Well, when two-factor authentication first became a big thing and started being used, people thought it was a nightmare. Now they're used to it because we're used to it with our phones. You know, it's, 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 we're used to that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'd like to I'd like to thank you, Christopher, for for coming in and being a part of this. Hopefully, we'll see you again on some other stuff. I really want to get Love you to. in on one of our AI conversations. I think I think yeah. you know you can have some good insight into some of that. And I think we've got a couple coming up. So sounds great. So, so all of you guys out there, thank you very much for coming and listening to us. You will be seeing us again, and you probably will be seeing Chris again when we're talking about <laughs> AI and some terrible thing that could be happening. So sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be there you'll be there right so thank you chris and thank you to all of you out there please feel free to subscribe to the channel and the podcast be it on youtube or be it on spotify or one of the many other different ways that you can gain access to us if you've got any comments there's plenty of ways to get in touch with us in either descriptions or through finding us on the internet or through linkedin so please feel free to get in touch and let us know your thoughts on anything you want us to cover or anything you you think we should be expanding upon and we'll speak to you all again soon thank you very much